Okay, good morning. Welcome to Ethics Awareness Week. My name is Brian Birch. Uh, I am the director of the Center for the Study of Ethics here on campus. And before we do anything else, I just want to publicly thank everyone who's been involved in the creation of this week. We've had faculty, staff, students, people from all over campus uh, jumping in to make this week possible. And so I just want to publicly thank the members of my staff in the Center for the Study of Ethics, the Philosophy and Humanities Department, uh, our faculty advisory board. This is truly a, a team effort. So for those of you who don't know, this week, uh, we do this every year. We host an entire week of events. Uh, this week we have 17 sessions that are uh, focused around the theme of ethics in global context. And we've already hosted sessions that deal with international business ethics, with migration and trafficking, with aviation and transportation ethics. And we've got a number of sessions uh, going on throughout uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday. Uh, the session for today is going to be focused on the role of religion in global ethics. And I want this to be a more discussion-oriented uh, session, so my job will be to present uh, some questions uh, and to, uh, to share with you uh, some of the background so that we can have a conversation about some of the, the critical questions uh, in play uh, here. So let me spend a few minutes just helping to frame the the conversation. I didn't mention this, but in, a, uh, in addition to my work on campus in ethics, uh, my primary area of specialization is religious studies, and especially uh, religious diversity related issues. So this is really an area that uh, I'm, I'm deeply involved in and very, very passionate about. Okay, so what's our purpose here today? The first thing is that, uh, as I mentioned, that we are planning to address the role of religion in global ethics uh, alongside all of these other topics that we're talking about uh, throughout the week. And secondly, and more specifically, we're going to uh, critically engage uh, the principles behind a specific project which is named the Global Ethics Project. So as we go along, feel free to take notes, jot down questions, uh, because uh, in a little while we're going to be opening this up to a conversation. So what is the Global Ethics Project? This was launched in 1990 uh, by a Catholic theologian by the name of Hans, Hans Kuhn. And some of you know that Hans Kuhn was one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century. He was deeply involved in the Second Vatican Council, which was uh, the Catholic Church's effort in the 20th century to re-engage with uh, modern society in a variety of ways. So you can uh, characterize Hans Kuhn as a progressive Catholic theologian with tremendous uh, influence. And in 1992, uh, he published uh, the seminal book on this uh, effort, and it was entitled Global Responsibility in, uh, in Search of a New World Ethic. And in there, he laid out uh, the basic framework and the basic principles for trying to establish an ethic that could be workable and manageable uh, across a variety of cultures. And the public uh, facing aspect of this project was the 1993 declaration entitled Towards a uh, Global Ethic and this was presented at the 1993 Parliament of the World's Religions which was held in Chicago. So to tell you a little bit about the Parliament, uh, this, was, this is a convening which as you see takes place uh, every a uh, few years. It's kind of like the Olympics of interfaith engagement. Uh, the first parliament was convened in Chicago in 1893, and it was the first convening of its kind in human history, right? At no time prior to that had 
major leaders from the different religious communities come together to engage in dialogue, information sharing, and a mutual understanding. So that happened in 1990, or excuse me, 1893, uh, as part of the Columbian Exposition that was the uh, precursor to the World's Fair. Then, 100 years later, in 1993, there was a, a centennial convening of the parliament in Chicago again. And this 1993 parliament uh, was the meeting where the global ethic document was presented to the world. And uh, so this represents, this year represents the 30th anniversary. And that's part of the reason why I thought this session would be appropriate because it's been 30 years uh, since this project was launched and it's, uh, a lot of things have happened since then and uh, it bears conversation and discussion. Just to give you a sense of the other cities where the parliament has convened since that time, right, in 1999 in Cape Town, then in Barcelona, then in Melbourne, and how many of you knew that the Parliament of the World's Religions convened in Salt Lake City? Yes, wonderful pu uh, publicity uh, effort on the part of the Parliament. So in 2015, Salt Lake City was selected uh, to host the Parliament. And to that point, it was the largest Parliament convening that had happened. And so during October of 2015, 10,359 people officially convened in the Salt Palace Convention Center area uh, to uh, engage in dialogue and discussion. There were representatives from 75 countries. There were 215 faith communities that were represented there. There were over 800 programs and presentations and panel discussions and workshops that were held during that time. And then uh, in addition to that, there was a, a women's assembly that was convened just prior to the parliament, uh, which had 3,500 uh, attendees. And one of the things that we like to say during the parliament in Salt Lake City was that it was the most culturally diverse group of people in, in the state of Utah ever, even more so than the Olympics. Because the Olympics obviously brought together people from dozens and dozens of countries. But it didn't bring together the kind of cultural ri richness and cultural diversity that you saw from the parliament. So we had people from indigenous communities in Australia, uh, New Guinea, Africa, uh, South America, right? People, uh, Mongolia, right? N a number of different communities. Uh, made themselves part of this parliament. So I just wanted to say that as, a, as an aside. Uh, back to the, the, the global ethic. So here is, we're, we're going to read a little bit uh, from the document uh, to help uh, frame the discussion. So can I get a volunteer to read as we go? And please don't be shy. Thank you. Okay, so you see it spelled out pretty uh, specifically right there. The document affirmed that there were a, a common set of what they called core values and that these values were found uh, across the world religions. So that's point one. The second point of this quote obviously is the fact that these common values uh, are understood to be the basis for a global ethic, right? So the idea is that uh, Hans Kung and his team uh, were engaging in an effort in religious studies uh, to identify those te to identify the overlapping teachings that they saw as being essential to each of the great world religions, and from that they uh, affirmed them and articulated them in the document. Do I have another volunteer? Please. There already exist ancient guidelines for human behavior, which are found in the teachings of the religions of the world, and which are the conditions for a sustainable world order. 
Okay, thank you. So another thing to note from this statement is the idea that, uh, that these guidelines or these values serve as uh, the condition for a sustainable uh, world order. And so the idea behind the statement is that religion has played an essential role in shaping human society and individuality. And that religion, because it has been such a powerful force in, human, uh, in the human experience, right, that religion should be carefully studied, reflected upon, and that the ideas within the religion should be utilized and leveraged toward uh, global peace, which was uh, one of the main goals here, as you'll, as you'll see. Right? But one of, the, uh, one of the things to note about the, uh, the global ethic uh, is that it, uh, it doesn't mean to say that all religions have sustained all of these principles, because that certainly would not be the case. Nor is it meant to say that religions have not been the scene of some of the most barbaric and grotesque uh, episodes uh, in human history. And so the rationale behind the document is that religion has been a force for good, uh, for uh, community building, and all these values that we uh, espouse today but it has also been the justification and the means by which uh, he, uh, people have been uh, brutalized, marginalized, and uh, uh, it's been the scene of genocide in many cases and in multiple religious traditions. So just a, a little bit of groundwork there. Do I have one more volunteer? Maybe two. Someone over here? Thank you. The principles expressed in this global ethic can be affirmed by all persons with ethical convictions, whether religiously grounded or not. All right, so what's the key point? They want to make sure that the document is not only applicable to people who self identify as religious or as a part of a religious community. So even though they believe that these principles cut across uh, different religious communities, uh, Kung and others argue that they're applicable uh, to all human beings, uh, whether or not they self-identify as religious uh, or not. So that's another interesting uh, feature of what they're trying to do. All right, so before we look specifically at the five directives that were in the document, I want to play you a video. These, uh, the, the parliament released uh, a series of short two-minute videos on each of these directives. So I thought I'd play it for you to give you a sense of what they're trying to do, and then we can critically engage uh, with the ideas presented there. All right, so... The government launched a project to identify and set down the ethical commitments held in common by the world's religious, spiritual, and cultural traditions. Tonight, the parliament reaffirms its commitment to the global ethic, I don't know if and we invite you to story. do the same. Numberless women and men of all regions and religions strive to lead lives not determined by egoism, but by commitment to their fellow humans and to the world around them. Nevertheless, all over the world, we find endless hatred, envy, jealousy, and violence. In the great ancient religious and ethical traditions of humankind, we hear the directive, you shall not kill, or have respect for life. Conflicts should be resolved without violence within a framework of justice. There is no survival for humanity without global peace. A human person is infinitely precious and must be unconditionally protected. But likewise, the lives of animals and plants which inhabit this planet with us deserve protection, preservation, and care. Limitless exploitation of the natural foundations of life, ruthless destruction of the biosphere, and militarization of the cosmos are all outrages. 
We must cultivate living in harmony with nature and the cosmos. Every people, every race, every religion must show tolerance and respect, indeed high appreciation for every other. We invite all people, whether religious or not, to do the same. Numberless men and women of all regions and religions strive to live their lives in solidarity with one another and to work for the authentic fulfillment of their vocations. Nevertheless, all over the world we find endless hunger, deficiency, and need. Millions of people are without work, millions are exploited by poor wages, forced to the edges of society with their possibilities for the future destroyed. In many lands, the gap between the poor and the rich, between the powerful and the powerless, is immense. In the great ancient religious and ethical traditions of humankind, we find the directive, you shall not steal, or deal honestly and fairly. There is no global peace without global justice. If the plight of the poorest billions of humans on this planet, particularly women and children, is to be improved, the world economy must be structured more justly. In the developed countries, a distinction must be made between necessary and limitless consumption, between justified and unjustified uses of natural resources, and between a profit only and a socially beneficial and ecologically oriented market economy. We must develop a spirit of compassion with those who suffer, with special care for the children, the aged, the poor, the disabled, the refugees, and the lonely. We must value a sense of moderation and modesty instead of an unquenchable greed for money, prestige, and consumption. We invite all people, whether religious or not, to do the same. Numberless women and men of all regions and religions strive to lead lives of honesty and truthfulness. Nevertheless, all over the world we find endless lies and deceit, swindling and hypocrisy, ideology and demagoguery. In the great ancient religious and ethical traditions of humankind we find the directive, you shall not lie, or speak and act truthfully. No woman or man, no institution, no state or church or religious community has the right to speak lies to other humans. This is especially true for those who work in the mass media, to whom we entrust the freedom to report for the sake of truth, and to whom we thus grant the office of guardian. For artists, writers, and scientists, to whom we entrust artistic and academic freedom. For the leaders of countries, politicians, and political parties, to whom we entrust our own freedoms and for representatives of religion. Let no one be deceived. There is no global justice without truthfulness and humaneness. We must not confuse freedom with arbitrariness or pluralism with indifference to truth. We must cultivate truthfulness in all our relationships instead of dishonesty, dissembling, and opportunism. We must constantly seek truth and incorruptible sincerity instead of spreading ideological or partisan half-truths. We must courageously serve the truth, and we must remain constant and trustworthy instead of yielding to opportunistic accommodation to life. We invite all people, whether religious or not, to do the same.
Numberless men and women of all regions and religions strive to live their lives in a spirit of partnership and responsible action in the areas of love, sexuality, and family. Nevertheless, all over the world, there are condemnable forms of patriarchy, domination of one sex over the other, exploitation of women, sexual misuse of children, and forced prostitution. In the great ancient religious and ethical traditions of humankind, we find the directive, you shall not commit sexual immorality or respect and love one another. No one has the right to degrade others to mere sex objects, to lead them into or hold them in sexual dependency. We condemn sexual exploitation and sexual discrimination as one of the worst forms of human degradation. Let no one be deceived. There is no authentic humaneness without a living together in partnership. The relationship between humans should be characterized not by patronizing behavior or exploitation, but by love, partnership, and trustworthiness. The social institution of marriage, despite all its cultural and religious variety, is characterized by love, loyalty, and permanence. All lands and cultures should develop economic and social relationships which will enable marriage and family life worthy of human beings. We need mutual respect, partnership, and understanding instead of patriarchal domination and degradation, which are expressions of violence and engender counterviolence. We need mutual concern, tolerance, readiness for reconciliation, and love instead of any form of possessive lust or sexual misuse. We invite all people, whether religious or not, to do the same. of several parliaments, we have evolved and adopted and discussed a global ethic which guides and shapes the commitments of the parliament and perhaps guides others beyond the parliament as well. But we came to the realization that it was perhaps incomplete and that a fifth directive to the global ethic needed to address our relationship to our home, to our earth, and to each other. And to introduce that, Rabbi David Rosen, and then we will read the text. So, Rabbi Rosen. Thank you, David. He introduced my pre predecessors coming from the Holy City. Allow me some one-upmanship. I come from the Holier City. <coughs> From the city of Jerusalem, it is holy to Jews, Christians, Muslims, and so many more in the world. And I bring you the blessings of Jerusalem. It is, as you heard, my honor here simply to present, introduce the why and what we are addressing to the world from this particular gathering as the fifth directive of the global ethic. And you will be happy to know that that means that I'm the last speaker. While reference to environmental responsibility was contained within the global <coughs> ethic that was promulgated, issued in the centenary celebration of the Parliament of the World Religions, we recognize today that there is a need for a separate commitment to a culture of sustainability and care for the environment. Our knowledge of the threat posed by climate change and by the degradation of the ecosystem means that to a large degree, all the wonderful things that we're trying to do in the world on so many other issues are like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as we head for that massive iceberg. We can improve the quality of the lives of people on the Titanic, yes, and there are plenty of things that we should care about for everybody, but we are in the face of a catastrophe, and that requires action like no other.
As we have heard today, our behavior in the world, and especially in the developed world, is reckless. And that recklessness will boomerang. We have heard of the terrible poverty in the world, and yet there is enough food in the world to feed the world. But the world is not being fed. And therefore we are here to say, literally, in every sense of the phrase, enough is enough. We have to strive for a responsible lifestyle. Last night I was talking about theological humility from this stage. Now we need to speak of the humility of lifestyle, modesty of lifestyle and of conduct. That is a demonstration of our responsibility and of our connectedness to not all of humanity, but as has been said, to the whole of the cosmos. Let me, before I introduce those who are going to present this fifth declaration, fifth directive, let me refer to an ancient Jewish midrash, homily of 2,000 years ago, that talks of people in a boat. And the people are in a boat on the waters and a man starts digging, drilling a hole underneath his seat. And the others say, what are you doing? He says, none of your business. This is my seat. I'm drilling under my seat. They say, but you drill under your seat. We will all drown. There is total interdependentness in our world and the actions of one reverberate the upon the other for worse and for better. Finally, let me also conclude with another midrash well known to many here, that when God created the world, he took the first human being around for a guided tour of the Garden of Eden and said, look at all these wonderful things that have been created for your pleasure and joy. Take heed that you do not destroy them, for if you do, there is no one left to repair. That is our challenge. May we be worthy of it. May this declaration, this directive that you are about to hear, go out to the world so that we may save our planet, save our ship, save our home. Thank you. Okay, so that gives you a, a flavor for uh, what the... Uh, the global ethic was about and how it's been thought about uh, and applied. Uh, so, uh, and I included the last clip to show you that in the, the uh, Toronto Parliament that a fifth directive was added. So originally there were four. They added the fifth one to explicitly address sustainability and care for the earth. And uh, so that's officially part of it now. So let's look at these five directives. Let's restate them and then let's uh, uh, open up the floor for some provocative questions. So, uh, Dr. <coughs> Musset, do you mind reading the five directives, reading the five directives oh, for us? And I'm, I'm back here, by the way, so when this conversation happens, I'm watching, I'm not listening. She's All right, judging. I'm judging. Uh, directive one commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life. Directive two, commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. Directive three, commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. Directive four, commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. Directive five, commitment to a culture of sustainability and care for the earth. Thank you. Okay, now I want to read just a couple of quotes from uh, a scholar who was reflecting on the global ethic, just to give you a, uh, a sense for how we might think about this. So, do I have another volunteer? This is Dr. Shingleton, please. Oh, if the microphone is, yeah, thanks, Ethan. It's helpful. An obvious approach to dialogue between adversarial groups is to search for similarities but in matters of religion, that can be an elusive, not quixotic, quixotic, if not quixotic, undertaking. Without the means to distinguish between spurious and genuine parallels, dialogue can quickly go astray. Okay, there's something very important contained in that quote. 
So I want to reiterate, the methodology of the global ethic is to search for commonalities, right? But when you search for commonalities, right, you need some criteria, some set of criteria by, with, by which you're identifying what is essential to a religion, what is core to a religion, and what is secondary to a religion. And what Shingleton is pointing out here is that without being able to distinguish between the genuine elements of religion and the peripheral elements, uh, interreligious dialogue can quickly go astray. That's an understatement, I believe. Okay, a couple more, somebody else. This is an interactive event, or is supposed to be. Claire, thank you. Do you have the mic? Or? Some claim that religious traditions are derived from a single primordial source, and that they are fundamentally homo sorry, they are fundamentally homogeneous despite their distinctive symbolisms. Others hold that religious traditions are essentially resistant to comparison, given their cultural, linguistic, and metaphysical differences. Okay, so again, that's uh, worth uh, reflecting on, uh, because one way of identifying what is common between religions or what is essential between religions is to identify a common source of the, uh, these elements and of these values. So that's one way of approaching uh, this uh, argument for common values. Someone else. Yet others more modestly suggest that religions are essential agreement about basic, basic ethical norms, even though they may conflict theologically and metaphysically. Thank you. So we've got three positions represented here. We've got the position that basically says that there is a single source of, of all religions Right? And these are the common elements between the religions. Then we've got another position that says, no, religions are too distinct. Right? They're too singular in order to draw those kinds of comparisons. And that there's really no way to identify these universal uh, core values that the, the document suggests. And then the third way, what you might call the middle path, is the effort to say, OK, maybe we can distinguish between common ethical norms across these religions, uh, even though obviously there are differences in theology and metaphysics and worldview and you know, a variety of other things. And the third way is the path that Hans Kung chose to pursue in the global ethic. So he and his team and the drafters of this document didn't want to ignore religious differences and didn't want to ignore the particularities of Islam or Buddhism or other indigenous uh, religious communities. So they wanted to maintain the distinctiveness, right, but identify things that they believe uh, emerge out of their teachings. Okay, so that is the question that I want to uh, discuss with you. So I've, I've framed three questions here. First one, to what extent is it possible to identify a set of core values, right? Is this possible? Uh, do these efforts rob religious communities of their distinctiveness? That's been a, an important uh, argument. Uh, and third, how might these efforts be applied to other areas of human engagement? What I'm thinking about there is politics, economics, right? A variety of other human institutions. Right? So. The, the, there's a, a way of thinking that has said uh, we need to move away from uh, utilizing religious ideas because religion has failed right, at advocating for justice and advancing the norms that they themselves teach. Uh, but Kuhn and others want to say that religions are mixed bags. Right? Within each religious tradition, there are obviously elements of marginalization and hate, discrimination. Right? Those elements are long-standing and they're present in whichever religious tradition you choose, at least of the, more, the most significant ones. Right? But each of these same traditions 
right, uh, possesses elements that uh, align very nicely with the values that non-religious people are espousing in which you saw in the video, right? Gender justice, right? Ecological justice, uh, truthfulness, uh, uh, et cetera. So that's the point of departure for me in our conversation. So I'm interested in your thoughts about this. Yeah, and there's a microphone coming around, so if you can wait, that would be great, so the rest can hear. So, to the first question? Address it, anyone you like. So, I would argue that as humans, we can all agree that we are humans, and that we may disagree theologically, but there are certain things that we do agree on. And so I think that the extent that is possible is not to the extent of our beliefs, but to the extent of our actions. So I would argue that we can come up with those core values, and the values that we should come up with is what is an acceptable way to interact with one another. And I think that eventually we could all come to an agreement with that. Okay, so you're in favor? And how do your own values and your ideas about what is common align with what you saw in the video and what you saw uh, on the slide? Um, as of now, I agree with all of the, um, all of the five directives. Um, with my core beliefs, it doesn't contradict any of them. Okay, thank you, good. We'll go here and then here. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to address the second question. Um, I feel like these efforts do not rob religious communities of their distinctiveness because to be human is to be different and to be human is to find a path between all these differences and these efforts are simply just to find that path and to create connections between people while still keeping still holding the values of everybody's differences close to them. Okay, thank you. Let's go over here. Oh, you've got the mic, great. Yeah, yeah, there we go, okay. Um, I'll do the first one, like, to what extent is it possible? Uh, I feel like it's extremely possible to be able to uh, like live a life where we're living our the core principles and values of our religions. Uh, yes, no matter what, there's gonna be some differences between religions and that's not necessarily a bad thing but it's just a matter of like knowing we have like the uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion in this country and we need to just know to not be passive about it no matter where we are because like some people think that means we just can believe what we want with those rights but it means we can act and express ourselves within those rights and we have that right in this country so just not being passive with that and knowing when to do that in the appropriate way as much as we can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so is there a contrarian voice? Does somebody want to challenge these ideas? Great. Um, howdy. Howdy. On the third pillar, the one that dictates a society is to be tolerant, not in these questions necessarily. Um, there was a person, I think in like 1940, who said that tolerance will create a paradox because in a truly tolerant society, there will eventually surface intolerant ideas. And so how do we find the marriage between that ideal and the reality of the situation. Okay, thank you. That's well said. So let's put a label on this, since we teach philosophy, or I do, and Shannon and Mike and others do. Let's call this the paradox of tolerance. Right, because somebody can advocate tolerance as a norm. Everybody should be tolerant of everybody else in all circumstances. Why is that a problem? It sounds really good. Why is it a problem? 
Because then anyone could do anything, no matter how good or bad, in the path of self-righteousness or tolerance. Perfect. Thank you. So, if you say one should be tolerant to everyone in all circumstances, do we tolerate the intolerant? And you say, well, no, we won't tolerate the intolerant because then we're, we're actually fighting against intolerance. Right? Thus lies the paradox. Does that make sense to you? So, the, but, but you, you might say, okay, well, that's just philosophers being funny, you know, and we're very funny. Uh, but it actually goes to something very powerful. It goes to this question of you ha we have all of these norms and all these values and all these principles, but every single one of them have limits, right? And part of the challenge of identifying ethical principles and applying ethical principles is how far they apply and in what context they apply and in what context they do not apply. So I appreciate that uh, countervailing comment because it's, use it's useful for our conversation. Somebody else have the microphone? I think if you tolerate uh, everything, everyone, on the other hand, it means no one tolerates anyone else. And then the, uh, our, uh, the humans cannot live as a community. Like uh, Thomas Hobbes, he had a theory, I, I think um, many of you know, it's um, uh, you have to compromise some of the individual freedom in order to live together as a society. Okay, that's another element too. Uh, freedom isn't universally applicable either, there, right? There are limits to freedom in order to make the principle of freedom function more effectively. Okay, so here's one. I'll just voice a, a countervailing uh, perspective. Uh, there are millions of people around the world who, if they were sitting in this room, would watch those videos and say, I object. This is not my religious tradition. I don't affirm the values that the parliament is espousing. Uh, so if I am a Muslim or I am a Catholic or I am a uh, practitioner of Buddhism or I am a Latter-day Saint, right, what, do, what do we say to someone who says, I don't believe those are core values because my values are very different from what you liberals in the parliament are espousing? I would ask them what their values are and why they have those values and like try to find again some common ground between what we're saying and what they're saying. I think that's exactly how Hans Kuhn would reply. He would say, I, I, he, he would say, I believe, I, I will want to honor the, the uh, distinctiveness of your values and understand that there are values in your community that don't align with what uh, with what we're doing and obviously that's the case in any religious community but but what you said is very important right it's the activity of searching for a common ground uh, and without that search without that kind of, of dialogue uh, then we're, we're prone to misunderstanding and we know historically that uh, misunderstandings between religions has led to uh, devastating consequences. Well, I was also going to say, like, if you do have not the same values, that doesn't mean you can respect each other. Um, I think being like, okay, well, I respect that you feel that way. I might feel different, but that doesn't mean we have to not be okay in respecting one another. Okay, so you would put the, the principle of respect or the value of respect as something that should, that should be common, right? That regardless of individual ethical beliefs, that there needs to be respect for that happen. Okay? Somebody else had it? Oh. Make it, you make it quick since you, we've already heard from you. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, so I kind of piggyback off of that and the tolerance thing. I think if someone says their values aren't what those directives were, 
that's when the tolerance kicks in and to a point of like you can tolerate someone who doesn't think those are core values um, in my mind just as long as long as they're not like actively harming others or you or the environment um, I think that's when sort of the tolerance and respect kind of have to be looked at again but if like they don't think that one of those directives is a core value. I can't say no to that. You know, I can't say that they should. I can let them, I can tolerate them being that. Okay. So uh, I observed a principle in your comments, right? There was the respect principle, and you mentioned a principle. What is it? What was the... You said, as long as they don't harm someone else. Well, that was what, that's what you might call a harm principle, right? In other words, distinctiveness and differences, right? The line between them is harm. And then you've got the challenge of defining harm, uh, which in, uh, in certain cases is easy, right? Bodily harm, physical harm, property harm. Uh, it gets a little bit more tricky in terms of psychological and emotional harm, all right? But there's also a category in certain religious communities, spiritual harm. And that's where things get tricky because somebody uh, might believe that uh, the values that are espoused by somebody else is actually spiritually harmful, right? And then where do you go from there? That's where things get messy, I would say. Claire. My question, uh, my question lies in this idea of common ground. And if we were to suppose that we searched for common ground and we were able to find enough of it to establish a global community as is perhaps the stated goal, um, and we have this massive dialogue, how can we prevent the uncommon ground, which differentiates us from other communities, uh, from being destroyed? That is, if our goal is the commonalities, how do we prevent ideological colonialism destroying traditions that are different from our own? Uh, thank you for giving voice to an important criticism of, of these kinds of efforts, right? There is this kind of, uh, uh, some, many of you have heard the term colonialism, right? There are all kinds of forms of colonialism, economic colonialism. Uh, but there can also be uh, what you might call theological colonialism, where, right, the, the implication, one might worry, this isn't my view, but one might worry that if these values and principles are realized that as, as we mentioned in the second uh, question that the distinctiveness of these communities will be robbed in favor of some kind of generic form of religion that is really not distinguishable from, a, from secular forms of religion. And so then the question is, well, why do I need my religious community at all if I'm espousing values that don't connect with my religious community? So that is an important consideration, I think, in uh, reflecting on these things. Uh, I'm almost out of time, but I just wanted to share something that you might find uh, of interest because uh, within religious communities, at least within the American religious context, uh, people historically identified themselves by religious community. Or uh, within the Christian context, what you might call denomination. So if a person says, I'm a Christian, and the, their, uh, uh, the person they're talking to said, well, you know, what cr kind of Christian are you? What would they be likely to say 50 years ago? They would probably identify themselves with their denomination. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Baptist. Uh, and the same is true in the Jewish community, right? People self-identified according to different kinds of groups. But the point I want to leave you with is that the, the bond between people within 
religious communities is weaker than the bond between people of the same political orientation. And so recent studies have demonstrated that there's a stronger connection between conservative Catholics and conservative Jews than there is between progressive Catholics and conservative Catholics. And that is true for almost any religious community. That's something that is really interesting for those of us who study religious trends, right, and how people identify as being religious or not, right, because some of those traditional communal bonds of religion are giving way to stronger social connections. And it's especially true in the younger generations. So you, those affinities strengthen the younger the age. And so it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, people have this kind of, uh, this idea, this concept that all these different religious communities are living together in harmony or not, right? But the, the actual situation is much more complicated and much more fragmented than has been traditionally believed. So I think these questions are applicable uh, with that in mind as well. Uh, so with that, I, will, I thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming. I, I, I value your comments, and uh, hopefully it'll give this a little bit more thought, maybe, you know, 10 minutes at some point. Have a great day. Enjoy.